Welcome back to another episode of RNT Fitness Radio. I hope you've had a great start to the year, you've set some ambitious goals for yourself, and you're attacking them already with relentless focus. Today I'm joined by Sital and Biraj, who have both undergone awesome transformations in the last year. Before the age of 40, Biraj had a goal to get into photo shoot condition, and so in February 2018, he achieved this goal. His photo shoot then inspired his wife, Sital, to do exactly the same, where she also got into the shape of her life and did a photo shoot while being on a vegetarian diet. This episode is jam-packed with value from the both of them as they talk about balancing their busy jobs that involve frequent trips abroad, looking after their young boys, and fulfilling their own health and fitness goals. Both of them go deep into their underlying motivations, why a transformation is never driven by only the physical, what it takes to manage priorities, and the importance of having the right mindset when looking to create long-term change. So if 2019 is the year you're looking to get into the shape of your life, then this episode is one you won't want to miss out on. My name is Biraj. Uh, I'm 39 years old. Um, I'm a, a director of customer relations working for um, Camelot. So I work in the lottery business. Um, and yeah, just a, just a normal guy in that respect. Um, you know, uh, father of two kids, you know, active, love my sports and uh, just love doing the things that, you know, dads enjoy doing with their kids really. So um, yeah, just a normal guy in that, in that sense um, with just a, a motivation to, uh, to want to, you know, stay fit, stay healthy and be an inspiration uh, for, for my two boys, really. So that's me. Hi, I'm Sital. I am, I'm 39 too. I'm 11 days older than Viraj, which I get constantly rubbed into every year. It gets my birthday and oh, you're older than me. <laughs> um, I'm a mum of two boys. Um, Shaden's four and Nayan's nine. So, um, yeah, I work for a small company, so I kind of pretty much run the show of the company. I'm a general manager. I kind of pretty much do everything from HR to traveling to China to managing everything. And we produce um, swimwear, so very uh, body relevant, um, and lingerie and nightwear for like the high street. So we do like the retailers. I've been in retail, like head office retail for a long time. So I've worked for like some Primark head office, River Island, um, so I've always worked full time. Um, yeah, as, and yeah, I've got two lovely, two lovely boys who are so active. And being an, being a mum of boys um, is hard work because they love to rough, play rough and ready. They want to run around all the time. They're really active. And um, so our weekends and weekdays are just manic because literally from work to picking up from school, like going to the after school activities, taking them to football, football matches. You know, getting them ready for bedtime is like Olympic marathon session. Um, so yeah, it's we're it's a busy, constantly on the constantly go, yeah. on the go family. Um, we've got a little dog as well, uh, who's pleasing behind us. Um, so we're always out and about. You know, our weekends are like if the weather if the sun's out, we're either got the, we're on the bikes or we're in the park taking the dog for a walk and the kids are running around with the dog. So yeah, we're a busy, active family. Um, I've always done some form of gym work and um, fitness classes, boot camp, you name it, hot yoga, been there, done that. <laughs> literally. Yeah. Body pump, everything literally. Um, since I, since I left uni, I think since I started working, I think I've always done like spin classes and, yeah, been a member of all sorts of gyms from David Lloyd to Virgin. Yeah. And that's kind of worked for us actually. Like, you know, when we got married, um, I was really active and into my sports and, uh, and gym. Sithal was the same. And so, you know, before we had kids, you know, we would spur each other on and it would really help um, kind of, you know, um, push each other to, to stay active. And I remember, you know, a conversation that we had before children was that actually we wouldn't let children um, kind of, uh, ruin our uh, sort of physiques and the way that we eat and things like that. You know, you see so many people that um, actually not even children, even once they get married, it's kind of like, you know, they just let yeah, it go exactly. a little bit. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, we kind of said, we don't, we don't <laughs> want to be that couple that kind of lets it go. And, you know, by the age of 40, you know, we're overweight and, you know, the kids are not inspired to stay ha- active or anything like that. And, you know, I think kind of looking now, uh, yeah, at the time, if we were to look into the future and, you know, at 39 years old, um, you know, 
would we have said that, you know, we've both done photo shoots and been as lean as we, we have? Probably not. But I think, you know, our plan to stay active and stay healthy and stay, um, you know, fit, I think we've pretty much uh, kind of kind of kept to that in that respect. Yeah. I've been always pretty good, like with food, especially like I like my pet, a typical Gujarati household I grew up in. You know the shakbat roti for those Gujis out there. Um, <clears throat> literally every day. So, so for the for the non Gujis, can you just clarify what that is? Oh, so like rice curry and Chapati. uh, chapatis, basically. Um, yeah. So growing up, and my mum like was one of these super cooks, you know, always cooking, making Indian sweets, always have, we always had fried food in on the weekend and it would all be like homemade, but it would be like full on. She'd make like a six course meal. Um, and then, you know, when I went, you know, going up into university, that was all fine. And after I left university, kind of, you know, my mentality on food changed quite a lot. Um, I actually started, I actually used to eat meat um, when I was growing up, actually. Um, like I used to have chicken, kebabs, you name it. I used to eat it. And then, but my mum never cooked meat at home. So when we stopped going out to restaurants and things, I kind of turned vegetarian naturally. I didn't actually just suddenly convert to vegetarianism and then I couldn't go back to eating meat for some reason. Even now, sometimes I'm really tempted to eat chicken and I can't, I just can't do it. Um, I just physically can't eat it. Um, so, yeah, so I think the food element for me, so as soon as I left university and started working, you did become a bit more conscious of what you're eating because I was working in London, you're exposed to more foods. Um, so I was always conscious of what I was eating. I was, when Barry B and I got married, I kind of tried to push that on him a little bit. Yeah, see, but I was, he, I was the never, opposite in that, like, I never really thought that much about food. But I was always so active. So, you know, um, as I mentioned, you know, from a young age, I've always been into sports, a uh, big football player. Um, you know, I did football at, at school. I did rugby at school. I did athletics at school. You know, I was one of those kind of annoying kids that was just naturally good at sports. Um, and um, so for me, growing up was very based, you know, focused around sports. Um, I played for a Saturday and a Sunday football team. Um, uh, you know, I was doing karate at the time. And so for me, I, I guess I was kind of blessed in the sense that I, I, was, I wasn't really watching what I was eating, but I never really put weight on because I was always so active. Um, and it's funny because, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of an outlier in terms of my family because, um, you know, uh, all of my uncles and my cousins are all big guys. Um, I'm not saying they're fat, but they're just generally big boned. <laughs> I'm going to be careful what I say here because they're, they're, they're really big bone. Like, yeah, <laughs> big bone, I'm going to say. But the, the, the point is that I was always kind of the, the skinny one in the family. Um, and I think that's just down to the, the level of activity. Um, and then kind of university started um, and kind of my martial arts uh, dropped off slightly. But that's when I started to kind of get into the gym a little bit more. So, um, you know, my flatmate and I, we, used to, we joined a local gym um, and we used, to go, we used to go training together. But it was just, it wasn't following any particular plan. It's kind of like whatever he thought that day we, we'd end up doing or if I thought something, we'd end up doing that. Um, so it was almost like going to the gym for the sake of going to the gym rather than actually going into the gym and having a proper plan um, and kind of monitoring and, and sticking to that plan. I think also back then, I mean, you know, we are that bit older. I think back then, like gym workouts, weights, the, that wasn't such a big thing in the UK at the time. Like going to the gym wasn't such a big thing. Like going to the gym, like when you joined up, like I remember one of my first gym membership was like David Lloyd's, right? You paid 65 pounds and it was really the number of cardio machines that were there at the time and the majority of people would run. And there's a bit of a to-do actually. I would never go into the weights area because it's so dominated by those unfortunately big guys, big yeah. guys yeah. who were like, you know, typical Asian guys who just it was quite, it was quite intimidating. So for me, I became a natural runner. I just started, just started running cardio, maybe did a fitness class here or there, but weight training definitely, even I think for guys, like on a commercial level, wasn't really a thing for us. Yeah. And there's a bit of an ego thing there as well, right? Yeah. You know, you go into a gym, you've got, you know, you kind of walk in there thinking, yeah, I'm more tough. And you know, then you, <laughs> you're lifting like four like dumbbells, 14 dumbbells. And you know, you've got a guy next to you that's like, you know, doing double that or whatever. And kind of, it, it, it is intimidating in that respect. 
But I think, um, you know, what I never realized is, you know, these guys, they, they, you know, they just do that from the beginning. They worked at that and that's over time. And, you know, you see the same people in the gym, you know, day in, day out, week in, week out. But the penny never dropped that actually it's about that consistency and that's how you get to lifting um, heavy weights and, and looking the way that they did. Mm. You can't just rock up, uh, do a few cardio machines, you know, uh, do a few, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, bicep curls and, and, and that's it really. So I think, you know, like I said, got to uni, that's where I got into the gym. And then after university, um, kind of started to think about getting back into um, martial arts, but then kind of the work life takes over um, and that, you know, that became a bit of a distraction uh, or excuse, depending on how you look at it, I guess. Um, and it wasn't until um, Nayan was born and then he was old enough to start a martial art that I then got back into martial arts again. Um, so I, I kind of, you know, for me, playing football once a week was a given, martial arts was a given, um, and, you know, my weight kind of stayed stable, but I didn't have the physique, physique that I wanted. Um, and, you know, I read, I read a lot of your articles and, you know, you refer to that skinny fat. That's exactly kind of where I ended up. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I think, you know, at one point, kind of you look at yourself, things start to go in the wrong direction. So, you know, I was noticing that we, we weren't there yet, but it was heading towards that kind of, you know, letting yourself go that we talked about, you know, many, many years ago when we got married. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that was personally for me, that was the, the kick up the backside to say, right, you know what? I need to start um, doing something about this because it's going to be positive for our children as well. I think, yeah, I think, but on the flip side for me, you know, I had two kids, you know, um, <clears throat> I think if you, I, I can show you pictures, but basically after name, it wasn't so bad because um, he was like a average size baby. But even then I was quite a small frame and then I had this huge, massive bump. Literally it was huge and, you know, so I had Nay and then obviously uh, four years later I had Shaden. And Shaden was a big baby. He was a nine pounder. He was massive. And again, I in between Nay and Shaden, I'd actually lost a lot of weight and become quite small again, but not to the level that I achieved with R&T. Um, and then when I had Shaden, I'd literally like ballooned out massively. And I think I must have been as well, straight after Shaden, I must have been about size 16, size 14. I was quite big like after I had him. Naturally, the weight did come off because obviously of breastfeeding and whatever, you know, and I, can, I started getting active again, you know, I started walking a lot. Um, I was quite active as a mum anyway. I would be out and about all the time. So that was never an issue. And then I think just when I, just before I started back at work, um, went back to work sort of full time and Shane was going to nursery, I started back at uh, boot camp classes to try and just get myself back in. But the second time around, for some reason, when I went back to those classes, it just didn't do anything I don't know if that was because I was older my body had completely changed the requirements that I needed you know I thought I was being really good with food um but I, it, you know I think as you get older if something happens to you that they don't tell you about like your metabolism changes completely your your, phys, your muscle capability changes completely so what I achieved when I was like 35 and then close to 40 was so different mm. and it just wasn't working and then Beryl showed up with RT and he was started sort of around July last mm. year. Um, I, think I remember we came in just straight back from holiday yeah. and you were literally going into it and then like literally a few couple of months in, he was like, honestly, you start it, start it. And I kept, no, I don't think I can do it. You know, how are you going to train? How am I going to train? How are we going to put it in? And I don't know if I can do this. And, you know, you go for it first and let's see how you get on. And we went through a little bit of a, a kind of like a, a battle of how we're going to manage. And then I think around November... I think it was but I yeah. started November yeah. 2017 yeah 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 so around November Gerard said like just do it and he goes look I'll pay for your first three months so I've been paying <laughs> I've been paying ever since <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but no it's interesting because again like you know before I started I didn't really know what I was getting into um, what's mine is and what's mine is yours and all that <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly exactly um, I didn't really know what I was getting into I didn't know how often I'd be training I didn't know what type of um, you know, training regime we'd have. Um, and, you know, when I got my plan and I was working through it um, and, you know, training four days a week, I was like, you know, it's, it's only four days a week. So we can work around this. You know, if you're going to be doing three, four days yourself, then we're good, right? We just need to speak to Akash and just make sure that we alternate our days. And so, you know, it's kind of where there's a will, there's a way, right? Um, 
And if you want it bad enough, Mm -hmm. you will find the solution. And I think, you know, that's my message to everyone that's listening to this, right? Everyone will want that physique, but do they really want it? And I think that's, that for me was like, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people that I'm either all in or I'm all out. And I think with these types of transformations, there's no room to be sat in the middle. You've got to be all in or you've, or don't bother type of thing, you know, because it's, it's very difficult to be able to um, keep that consistency if you don't have that mindset. And, you know, that comes to the social events, that comes to food, that comes to training. Um, you know, you have to work around your work schedules. Uh, you have to work around, you know, depending on the type of job you have, there's a lot of entertaining. So, you know, my role um, is very customer facing. So there's a lot of, lot of client entertainment and you just have to work around that. And I found the best way to work around that was just tell as many people as I can that I'm on a plan. And actually what happened was, it was really interesting is that at first, you know, at work when people are bringing cakes in for their birthdays or, you know, things like that, everyone would offer. Uh, and it got to a point where everyone knew that I was serious about doing this, that actually they were almost protecting me from, you know, going towards that cake or whatever it may be. And, you know, they, they were helping me on my journey. Um, and same goes, you know, same goes at home as well. You know, Sittal was um, completely supportive. My mum was supportive. You know, even the boys, like, you know, if, if I was heading towards that biscuit jar, you know, they'd be like, Daddy, I'm going to tell your trainer. I'm going to tell your trainer. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's, it's just funny how everyone, you know, starts to, to back you and support you. And then that keeps you in the game even more. I think what's really important, though, what Vera took was mindset, because I really learned quite a, a long way around about mindset. Because when I first started on in November, I kind of approached it in the same way I probably approached my boot camp classes. I kind of did the kind of um, the training. I did the training, um, but I kind of was like being really safe with it. So like I was just doing like, you know, little 4 kg little lifts here and little 7 kgs here. And, you know, I didn't really, you know, I was trying to be too safe. And you weren't even doing that much weight to be fair. Yeah. It was more cardio focus really. Yeah. Or, or like body yeah. weight stuff, wasn't it? Plyometric type but, exercises. Yeah, but with, with when but I started. that being before, right? Yeah, that was before. Yeah, but with yeah. RT, even then, I was still like, I didn't, I didn't really... I didn't grasp the progressive load concept. I think that's really important. I think you really need to understand where it can take you because if I look back then where I was doing like on my legs, I was doing sevens and nines. I'm doing like 24s now. Who, who'd have thought I'd have jumped? But that's because I didn't push myself. I think the pinnacle moment for me or the realisation of the whole process really happened after my dad passed away, I think, because I haven't really mentioned this at all to Gerard or to you, actually, um, that at that point when my dad passed away and when I came back with RNT a couple of months later, that became almost, it wasn't just a physical ch- change, it was an emotional and mental change where everything focused on this training and that's when I started seeing the change mm. and that's when it became a thing and I think the why and why you're doing this has to come emotionally mentally and physically because before then although my progress was happening do you remember I remember saying to you I'm feeling frustrated and not get seeing the changes and that was me that was me because I wasn't that but that you're also state you're also there. comparing everything on your journey with mine it's like, oh, but you lost this much weight in the first three weeks and I haven't. Or, yeah, that was you know, hard, actually. And you know, it was kind of this, like, almost like this internal competition. And I was like, look, you know, we can't think like this. Just because, you know, my body reacted in a certain way doesn't mean that your body's going to act in the same way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I remember people getting quite frustrated and upset that, you know, and almost to the point where you're ready to throw the towel in and say, no, this is just not working for me. Um, but it was just, you know trying to encourage her and support her to keep going because, you know, there's, there's a, a, a switch that will flip and all of a sudden you'll start to see that change. And it's really funny. I, I, it sounds pretty sad, but I often kind of go through all of my pictures because uh, they're all still on my phone. And, you know, just to kind of remind myself of where I was and kind of how it evolved over time. And it's literally like... Um, I remember Sithal saying when she was pregnant how overnight she just like woke up and had this bump. Um, this is kind of the same thing for me as like overnight I started to see abs and it's just like, damn, you know, it's like this thing actually works. And it, it, but it's about 
being on that journey and understanding it doesn't happen overnight um, and you need to have that support and you know I was there to push something into doing that she was there to push me on the food front because that was for me the hardest part um, you know I couldn't I, I said they'll argue that I still can't but I couldn't really cook um, before this process but now you know I'm doing my, my own meal preps um, to the point where you know Sitha was going out and I needed to to make something for me and the boys, I could I could do that now, and it's not just going to be beans on toast. It's going to be a decent, healthy meal. You've um, finally grown up then. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it took her to push me on the meal preps no, because I, I was taking. So they're so proud. <laughs> yeah, I got like I'm really OCD. Like you know, although we're quite similar in age and like temperament, and everything we're really different. Well, I'm very OCD. I'm very much organised, 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 you know, structure, routine and everything. And Birard is very much fly by the seat of his pants. Mm. So in that way, we're yin and yang. We quite complement each other in that respect, which is really good. But when he started his job, I said to Birard, I'm telling you now, if you want this to work, you're spending this time, you know, you're going to invest all this time, effort, money, whatever. You need to do it like this. And he didn't listen to me initially. Yeah. I think when I started in November, I was like, right, come on, let's meal prep together. Um, you know, like every time I make a recipe or something, I'd give it a go and I'd be like, Birod, you can do this with chicken or Birod, you can do this and mm. you can do that. So now it's kind of become a bit more fluid and I think a lot easier. And I think he started, I think that's when we both started realising like the benefits of meal prepping, being organised. You know, every evening after we've done our walk, we'll literally come home, he'll make his overnight oats or his protein, we'll literally get everything ready the next morning. And literally, we're pulling out boxes from the fridge because it's there. There's no room to deviate. There's no. Every time I tell myself that, or I say to Biraj, if he's heading for the biscuit jar, I say, you have got food to eat. It's just not that food. You've got to go get, get yeah, something yeah, else. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. When I'm at work as well, like my workplace is, my workplace is really bad for like having like Doritos, chocolate biscuits. You know, it's, it's an office full of women, um, and they love having eating crap every afternoon and I'm like I literally have to say to myself you can't you don't eat that because you've got food in your bag and you eat that first um so I think it's just it's just being really organized and making sure you've got everything there because if you don't you are going to cheat yeah like, like you said it just comes back to how badly you want it right yeah. um and I think um how badly you want it and how badly uh, or, or how how much support you can get, right? Because you know it, it's a tough, it's a long, tough journey, and you know I, I I don't think I'd believe anyone that says that they've they've done it without support from their partner, from their parents, from their friends, from their you know family, whatever it may be. You need that support network, um, and you know I think one of the nice things about R and T, and it's strange because you know we've only met you twice, one at my photo shoot and one at Tittle's photo shoot. But it feels like we've known you for ages. Yeah. Um, you know, there's others within the R and T group who I've never met before. But you know, we exchanged um, messages on Facebook because you know, Nella Sachin is a good example. You know, he was at a particular place in his journey that I'd just been through, um, and he kind of contacted me, and you know, we started talking, and you know, then I start following him on Instagram. He's following me on Instagram, and you know, now all of a sudden it's like. I kind of know this guy, but I don't know this guy. I've never met the guy before. Um, and you start to see all of those, you know, the posts. And I think, you know, I think the, the, the Facebook group, the, the Instagram pages, I think they're underestimated. Yeah. I think um, there's a lot of information that people will read and see and watch that they don't realize that they are taking in, mm -hmm. but actually is quite powerful and quite educational. Yeah, um, I think for me, like especially on the food front, when I first started, um, I think it's easier when you eat meat. If I'm honest, I think because with chicken you can do not you can do so much more. But it, you, you know, with vegetarian, like like hell, tofu is not the most exciting piece of food type that you can get. And it was interesting because I was actually um, I used to kind of notice whenever Gita used to put up posts about what she used to make, which she stopped recently actually, which is a shame. <laughs> she should put more up. Um, I actually lifted off her actually in terms of inspiration of going out there to actually look at what else could be done. And now I've got my own kind of thing. I should actually put stuff up. Yeah, you should post them up. You said you would. Yeah. I should. I have, I have done a couple of times, but um, not recipes. Not recipes. Not recipes, no. 
yeah. oh, I'll put some recipes up. Um, and I, you know, now it's like I'm really quite savvy in terms of how to prep the vegetarian food and how to make it exciting and not so boring. And, you know, I'm quite happy to eat the same things day in, day out now because I've actually made it interesting for myself. So you said, um, um, you said being a vegetarian has made it harder. In what sense do you think it's impacted you? Uh, why, why is it harder besides tofu being boring or uh, what, what? Well, I think something I learned through the process was at the beginning I tried to kind of zhuzh things up I suppose with using vegetables and then I think kind of halfway through I kind of clicked a little bit when I realized actually where I could have those mixed mixed vegetables once a day actually was counterproductive for me so I love my vegetables being a vegetarian. I love throwing everything in my food. I will eat every, any kind of vegetable you can give me. And actually, I soon realised that actually for me, it used to make me feel really bloated. Used to, my weight used to fluctuate because I think the, the variant variance of it was. So what I did was I took everything out and just left it to green, which was mainly broccoli. Um, and all of a sudden, everything just switched. Mm. Um, and you even said it to me, Akash, in one email, I remember sending you, you were like, you know, it can really mess with your system. Um, so then it kind of, then your kind of choices kind of knuckle down, don't they? Because then you've literally just got rice, a bit of broccoli and this kind of vegetarian protein alternative. So I, it, you know, I had to be creative on how I cooked, how I cooked, like how I prepared my tofu. So I learned how to you know, do different marinades and, and also even time, like cooking wise, time wise. I think, you know, it's really easy to go and get a bit of chicken and grill it quickly and put a bit of spice in and you're done. Whereas with tofu and other vegetarian alternatives, sometimes it's not as easy that because you've got to spend time flavouring it. But you also, you like that variety. Yeah. Whereas for me, actually, I was quite happy eating the same thing every day um, because I just, I, I just, like I said, you know, I wasn't a natural kind of, chef or someone that enjoyed cooking as such i just wanted to do what i needed to do mm. prepare it as quickly as i can and then not have to think about it mm. um so and, George wouldn't eat vegetables right he yeah and my whole palate's changed actually yeah but like broccoli i never used to touch it and now i really enjoy broccoli um so it's it's strange how and again it comes back to that mindset and how badly i wanted it because i was like you know what? i'm gonna have to eat my greens here because that, that amount of chicken and that amount of rice is just not going <laughs> to do it. Um, and, you know, in order to have a substantial meal, I'm going to have to add some greens into this. And then I started adding broccoli and just seasoning it with, you know, salt and pepper. And then I started adding green beans and runner beans and whatever. And then all of a sudden, actually, I was like, this isn't too bad. Yeah, so, there's, there's two sides to that. I mean, some people like a lot of variety. Yeah. Like all, but... Uh, other people like myself, we just prefer eating the same thing pretty much every day, just because yeah. then it allows you to go onto autopilot, exactly. cuts all their decision making out, and it makes it easier to comply to the diet. I think I if there's that yeah. less, Ooh, that's definitely worked, definitely. And even now, you know, I might have the odd kind of meal out and try and be a little bit more conscious about what I'm having, but on my good days, it's still the same autopilot that I was on when I was training. Yeah. In you know, eggs for my breakfast, protein shake, you know. Uh, chicken, rice, veg, protein shake, chicken, rice, veg. See, so Birach was really lucky because it's something I encountered on this journey. So before I started r and I was actually having a protein shake uh, for breakfast um, at the beginning. Um, and it was fine because I was having almond milk, I chuck a banana in there, blitz it up and I'll drink it. So when you sent me my food plan first and it was a protein shake, I could not stomach the protein shake. Literally, it was making me feel sick. Like yeah. I'd, I'd have one in the afternoon and I'd come home and be like, what's wrong with you? And I'd, I'd be like feeling like I'm nauseous, like really adverse reaction. I tried, I spent a lot of money on like vegan type ones, yeah. like my protein. There's one that you, I can't remember which one. Yeah, that we you tried did. all of them. We tried, I think, Reflex Microwave, which I thought is the, the cleanest and the most digestible. We tried vegan proteins. We tried all and sorts just, of brands, but nothing seems to work. Nothing seemed to work and it just made me feel recent. And so I think from, uh, and you were saying how quite that's quite, quite common. Vera was like, there's something wrong with you. It's your fault. There's something wrong with you. And I was like, it's not. I literally, can, I just feel so sick after having this milkshake and I shouldn't feel like that. Um, and that was really hard for me because I, that would have been the most easiest and most simplest form of getting protein. But also, um, the great thing with R&T as well is that there are alternatives. Um, you know, there were, there are other things that I, that I could have, like the Greek yogurt, which is brilliant. I can easily do that. And it's still good for protein. Um, 
it's things that don't you don't naturally think of as food sources for protein that I really quickly learned how to get it. Um, like before, I couldn't stomach eggs, absolutely hated eggs, and now I quite enjoy them. I actually like boiled eggs, I actually like poached eggs. Um, so yeah, that was a big, that was a really tough journey for me, the whole protein shake. Like I was really disappointed in my own self because I was like, why can't I eat, why can't I eat this protein? Um, it's funny though, like the, the common thing between us actually was the training wasn't the difficulty at all. In fact, you know, we both really enjoyed the training. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you know this, um, but for you know, everyone that's listening, um, with two kids, you know, we had to, we had to plan our workouts and how we do this. Um, so we basically alternate our training days. So Sittle trains on a Monday, I do Tuesday. She does Wednesday, I do Thursday. She does Friday, I do Saturday, Sunday. And, um, but we, we're in the gym at 5.30 in the morning and we alternate it so that the other one can then get up, get ready for work and sort the kids out. So by the time you know, I'm back from the gym, for example, the kids are already downstairs, they're already dressed, they're already having their breakfast. And then um, you know, I can have my shower and then we all leave around eight o'clock. Um, and then the next day we flip that and you know, I get the kids ready uh, while Sipple goes to the gym. And it kind of, that just worked for us. Um, so the motivation to get up early in the morning and get into the gym wasn't a problem. In fact, I really enjoyed it because the gym's pretty much empty. Like we, we are members of a gym that's quite local to us. Uh, it's part of a hotel. Um, so it's not kind of one of these uh, commercial gyms. It's a hotel gym. And you see, you see the same kind of four or five people in the gym um, at 5.30 in the morning when it opens. Um, but you've got the whole weights area to yourself. You don't have to wait for any cardio machines. It's just, you can go in, you can do your thing, you can get out. And, um, you know, I started to develop an even, you know, bigger passion for music because, you know, I went and bought myself a decent pair of headphones and, you know, I walked into that gym, I turned my music on, you know, noise cancelling. I, I, I'm just focused. I, I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to, you know, if yeah, you get to know people, you kind of say hello, but I wasn't there to socialise. I know a lot of people focus on the social element of going to a gym as well. For me, I just wanted to go there. I wanted to do my thing. I wanted to get out. Um, but as I said, you know, you kind of start to get to know people because you see the same people uh, day in, day out, week in, week out. And there's a kind of this, this moment for me, which kind of, you know, I look back on now and I, I kind, of, kind of proud of where I am now compared to then because there was this guy, he was quite a short guy to be fair, but he was, he was big, he was muscular and he was, um, he, he was lifting 36s. He was dumbbell pressing 36s. And I was on 28s, I think, at the time. And I couldn't even lift the 30 off the rack. And um, I, I just, I remember saying to him, I was like, he kind of looked at me. I didn't really know him. I said, oh, man, you're strong. And he's like, he just kind of like became like this... Uh, this messiah. This mess yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. He's like, listen, man, he goes, you can do it. You can do it. He goes, we're not big guys. You just got to try. You just got to try. Um, and so the next time I was at the gym, he was there. And I was like, do I ask him to see if he can help me and spot me or do I not? Because, you know, I kind of go in the gym myself. Um, I've never had anyone spot me but I didn't feel confident going and trying lifting those 30s and trying to, 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 to press them. So I basically just said to him, I said, look, do you mind, uh, you know, off the back of the conversation, do you mind if you can just help me, like, give it a go? So we did the 30s and it actually felt fine. And he's like, he goes, you're strong. But in my head, I wasn't, right? Because I was like, that was a, a barrier, a challenge that he helped me overcome. And then he goes to me, let's try the 32s. And I was like, what? You know, I've just, just got over the 30 mentality. Now you want me to try 32s. And we'd just done two sets of 30s. And he goes, oh, let's try the 32s. And I managed to hit another five reps on the 32s. And, you know, I, I went home that day and I was like, you know what? I've got to believe in myself. And this is where I was pushing Siddal to say, look, you've also got to believe in yourself and you've got to try. And, you know, now I'm doing 38s and people are looking at me saying, oh man, he's strong. And I was like, you know what? It's just this cycle. You know, I was in that same place and people are now saying to me, oh man, you're strong. And I'm having the same conversation with them that this guy had with me. And it's, you know, it's people, sometimes you come across people for a reason mm -hmm. and, you know, he was that kind of motivation to, to help me push uh, that progressive overload and uh, get past the mental barrier. And, you know, for me, 
if I can do the same for someone else, then I've, I feel like I've achieved something. And, you know, when I did the photo shoot and I remember when the case study went out and the reaction to that and the number of people that contacted me saying, you know, you've inspired me to now get into shape. And some of those people are now r and members as well. You know, that for me is powerful, right? You know, through my own journey, if I can now inspire someone else to get into shape and, you know, just you know, do the best that they can for themselves, then I think that's powerful. Yeah, I think the same for me. I think, like, <clears throat> I think how apprehensive was I to do that photo shoot? Literally mm. took me like six months. I think you were like, on me for, like, quite a long time to yeah, do the photo shoot. about three months it took us. Yeah. yeah, literally, like, because I was just, like, I just, like, couldn't see past that. I didn't think I could ever get to that stage. And even during the photo shoot, I was really scared, like the most intimidating thing I'd ever done because I'm happy to talk to people, happy to stand in front of people, present really confident like that. That was literally, you're that's, comfort zone. You're, that's you. That, that, unless it's all about you physically, it's, it's nothing else. You're there on your own doing that thing. And actually it was afterwards, like during the photo shoot, um, Ben, Viraj, Akash, you were all like saying this to me, you know, you look great, you know, you've got it, it's there, it's there. I just couldn't see it. Like even like the progress on my back, like I couldn't see it day to day because you're not in that position. You're not, you can't physically, you just wasn't there. When I look back at the photos now, I think I hit myself thinking I should have just had that confidence. Mm. And it is about having that confidence to, like Gerard said, is, you know, to push, you know, that mental barrier to try and push yourself. And I think for me, it's the same. If I can put, if I can inspire at least one female out there, not to just even like lose weight or get fit, but just to achieve something, that feeling of euphoria, that kind of confidence boost that you get from it is just, you can't put money on it. It's just amazing. And especially for someone, you know, who's had kids and who's going through the daily grind of life, sometimes you just need that kick to say, you got this, you know what you're doing. You know, it, it just, it's just, it's just awesome. Now I kind of walk back with my, sh- you know, I'm always thinking what Ben says, you know, walk with your shoulders back and you know, <laughs> all the stuff that he said on that photo shoot, I, it just sticks with me because I just think, okay, yeah, I get it now. I can see that now for me going forward, I just want to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And I just want to push those barriers. I want to get past, you know, I want to be able to achieve what some of the, there are some amazing female icons out there who do a great job at what they do when it comes to weight training and fitness and stuff, you know, and I would like to be able to achieve those things for my personal self. And yeah, if I can inspire someone to do it, go out there and do something like that. Great. I'll be, it'll be amazing. You know, I think the concept of a photo shoot is really interesting, right? So um, again, you know, if if there's one piece of advice that I can, I can give is you need to have a marker to be able to aim towards you know, if that's a holiday, if that's a, a wedding, if that's, you know, whatever it may be, because otherwise you just kind of, you just plod along, right? And you don't have that accountability or commitment towards a particular date. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, for me, we put that date in the diary, you know, months and months before. And, you know, I was working really, really, really hard. And, you know, um, the, the date was uh, at the, the beginning of February, um, and unfortunately, Sittal's dad passed away at the end of Jan. And I basically said to Sittal, I'm, I'm not doing, I'm not, there's no way I can do this shoot now. Oh, right? It was like five, six days before, no? Five, six days before, yeah. yeah. I was like, there's no way I can do this shoot. And, and even in that hard phase of our lives, um, she's like, I'm not, I'm not hearing that. Like, you've worked 12 months for that date you know, I want you to, and my dad would want you to, to go and do that shoot. And, you know, the funeral, my shoot was on a Tuesday and the funeral was on the Thursday. And so it was like, look, you know, there's, you're talking about two hours in the day, you know, there's nothing happening specifically on that, on that Tuesday. It obviously it's different if it's the day of the funeral or something like that, but she's like, you know, that's two hours. You've worked so hard. And, and, you know, I, I was, I was, I was going to cancel, you know, there's, there's no kind of, there's no two ways about it. I was just going to cancel it, but she pushed me to continue with that. Um, and it was tough mentally to, to kind of be there. And, you know, that's a, that's a real, um, kind of proud moment, but at the same time, it was quite a, a hard time in our lives. Um, but what pushed me to go and do that shoot was, was her saying, you know, 
I want you to do this. And again, this comes back to that support. Mm. Without that, I probably wouldn't have done my shoot. And then what would have happened is that shoot would have gone into the diary maybe another month, two months, because I think Ben was going away on holiday or something. Um, and so that was kind of the only date. Otherwise, the next one would have been a few months away. And then I probably would have just gone off track, gone off plan, because there was a lot happening in our personal lives at that time um, and probably just ended up kind of you know, undoing a lot of that hard work. So, um, so yeah, it just comes back to that support. And, you know, that what, ben, you know what more support could she have given me at, you know, probably the hardest time in her life losing her dad to then say to me, no, I still want you to go and do that shoot. Yeah, it was like <clears throat> that moment, like, you know, when you see someone doing that, and I saw how much Biraj put into it, um, <clears throat> also actually prepared me for when I did mine. Um, it, you know, it's not, you know, we, we both enjoy the whole, our, like the whole process, I still do. And I think that's one, one of the, the undermined thing enjoy it enjoy the process enjoy what, what you learn from it too um but at the same time it's not easy because especially when you're faced with the challenges of you know people you know Bill was getting comments like are oh, you you know you posted the post about the asian stigmas and you know people saying to him oh my god you look ill and why have you lost so much weight and why are you so skinny here and look at your face and why do you need to do? you know he kept getting all of that well, especially because as i mentioned you know i was the skinny one in the family and then, you know, they're seeing me drop up. more body fat. And they're yeah. like, well, what are you doing to yourself? Yeah. Um, and it, you know, the irony is that it's, it's all the, the, the overweight friends and people like that that are saying to you, why are you doing this? And it's yeah. like, you know, it's just so ironic that you've got people that are overweight questioning why you're losing weight. You know, we had like an uncle Kai over and he was like, you know, sitting there eating his food with his belly out and he was saying to Barrage, what's wrong with our food? And, you know, it's really healthy and look at me. And we're like, yeah. <laughs> 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 I was like, you know, so I could see what Barrage had gone through to like get to the stage. And, you know, that was meant to be both our moments. But I was like, I'm not, in no physical way was I ever going to stop him from having that moment because, you know, we had the whole day, didn't we? Plan we yeah, were going for a celebratory yeah. meal afterwards yeah, yeah, and all that exactly. stuff. And, and and I think like you know, <clears throat> you know, I think he needed that because mentally to go through, you know, you got you know the amount of emails you we were say exchanging when I was going through my little grind. Mentally, it's tough because mm. it's like you're you you know you go through emotions of I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Why am I doing this? Mm. Uh, I'm doing this because I'm you know I want to get somewhere. I want to I want to get those abs or I want to look great and I want to do this. But you you constantly have this. Why am I doing this? What am I doing this for? And you chuck because you're like I don't have to do this, but I'm doing it. You know. So it was really important for me to, for him to do that because I couldn't look back now and not allow him to do that because that would have been one of my regrets. Um, yeah, that's, that's a big, that's a part, uh, that applies to everything in life, right? You know, you always, got, you always question yourself, why are you doing this? And, yeah. But if things are worth pursuing, then the rewards at the end are always amazing, right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, one thing that I found interesting with, sorry, with, um, with your journey, Sito, is with Biraj, we had a, a shoot booked in that's probably about three, four months in advance. We booked it in November or so, right? We were going to do it for before Christmas. Then we realized that we needed a bit more time. We wanted to re, re, you know, regain yeah. track after Christmas. And then we booked it in for early Feb. But with Sitzel, we were kind of, like you said earlier on, we were just plodding along really and just getting a little bit leaner every week. And, yeah. you know, we had the, the deadline of your tattoo, but really that wasn't like a huge thing for you. You know, whether it happened or not, it was no, there was no like consequences, right? So we only booked the shoot, say, maybe three, four weeks before. So what kept you motivated? Because your body had changed significantly in the, in the 10 months prior, which is another subject I want to I want to touch on is, you know, how you had the ability to shift from a short-term fixed mindset to a, a longer term. But the first part of the question I want to ask is, how did you stay motivated while making significant changes but not having a real deadline for a long time? Yeah, I think I am a... I don't ever, I don't overtly show it, but I'm very highly competitive. I'm very competitive with Virage. Yeah, she saw my abs and she was like, I want that. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm joking. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really, like, I'm one of those people that when someone, when I put my mind to it, I put my mind to it. I will know to it. I don't need, I didn't need the photo shoot at the end, I suppose, if you put it that way. Um, if someone sets me a challenge, 
Um, and I think you've talked onto this actually. Um, someone sets me a challenge, says, you need to go and do that, I'll go and do it. Um, <clears throat> and I, I'm really, like I'm the type of person, like if I'm running on a treadmill and someone's next to me, I'll naturally compete with that person. Um, and I think, it, I think I don't, and I don't, you know, I, I'm just, just driven like that. And I don't, I think it was just kind of thing, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to go in 120% and do it. And I felt like when Virage said, go and do it, and, gave, and I think I owed it to Virage to put my all in because A, he was paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> Comes back to that again. <laughs> yeah. um, and B, he encouraged me to do it. And I thought, well, you know, if, if I'm going to make, if we're going to make a commitment to each other, and support each other you know it's unfair of me to be like oh, i'm not going to the gym today i'll go tomorrow you go to, you know if we were going to really make this work for each other then i had to, you know it was an investment that we had to both make and i didn't want to let him down and we would like we would literally kick each other out yeah. of bed like whoever's turn it was to train that morning it's like you know it's so easy to snooze that alarm or go yeah. back to sleep and like you know she'd literally be pushing me out of the bed yeah. saying no you need to get up and go um so I think, you know, that accountability. That accountability. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and I wanted to come to you and say, <laughs> hey, Akash, look what I've done. And I think it's really important, that relationship that you and I had, because I think um, your previous, um, was it Dylan? Yeah, who? Dylan, yeah. Dylan, I think he made a, he, he said that in the second, his second wave, when he got his second wave, you know, it's, those check-ins are so, so important. Yeah. Because I, you know, every Sunday evening, Sunday morning, I weigh myself and think, shit, I, um, oh, sod it, I've uh, <laughs> gone up on two kgs in weight or something stupid. So I'll be like, oh my God, I've got to tell Akash on Tuesday, I've got to like really bring this brain it back in. And, you know, that was so important. And that, if I'm honest, that was one of the key things that kept me accountable to you. Because I was like, you're spending all that time in me to give me this information and to push me along and tweak my plan and stuff. I was, I was the same to you. I, you know, it was yeah. down to me to help get those results and see what, what was going to happen. That, um, no, that, that, that reminds me. Go, go on, go on, go on. That was really important. I think that relationship between trainer and myself and you was to keep that accountability to each other because what's the point of doing it if you're not going to get results? I don't know. I, I think I'm just one of these OCD people that I, I literally saw something and I just had to go for it. But it was it was never, I don't think for either of us, it was never about getting a six pack. Yeah. Like, that, like, that was the bonus at the end of the journey, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I said this in my case study. Um, for me, the, the trigger was when I basically, every year from work, we get a Bupa health assessment. And, um, you know, up until then, everything was kind of always in the green zone. And then that particular year, because um, I had... Um, two kind of consecutive footballing injuries where I tore um, my calf muscle on both legs at different times. And it basically, it just took me out of action for months. Um, I wasn't doing my martial arts. I wasn't playing football anymore. I wasn't as active anymore. Um, you know, I've got a desk job anyway. So it was kind of, uh, it just wasn't working. Um, and everything in that assessment, everything started to go in the wrong direction. And where I was kind of in the mid green zone for something like, um, you know, cholesterol or blood pressure, whatever it might be, it all started like either high green or borderline amber. And, and for me, it was like, that was also a, a kick up the backside to say, right, you know what, now externally, I can see things are going in the wrong direction, but internally that's also happening. Um, and so that for me was the, the, the kickstart. And then I had one, um, at the year after, so this is probably a few, I think, a few months into my R and T journey, um, and it was amazing how you know everything kind of went back into the solid greens, um, and that was through you know training well, eating well, and you know to just see that difference, it, it was amazing. And um, I actually had this year's one just last week, um, and everything went further in the green. Oh, great. You didn't tell me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we hadn't, I hadn't had a chance to, um, I was, I'm going to send you the report actually, so you can take a look at that. Um, but what was the most interesting for me is um, when I did it last year, I was halfway into my dieting and I was 71.4 kg when I did the, um, the, the assessment. This time around, I'm halfway into my 
reverse, so to speak, or kind of, you know, muscle building phase. Yeah. Muscle building phase. Um, and this time I weighed 71 kg, but that was with clothes on. It's funny because even that morning, I weighed myself that morning and she was like, oh, I need to weigh you. I said, no, I'm, I'm 70.6. She's like, how do you know? So I weighed myself this morning. She's like, no, 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 just get on the scales. So I had my, like, my tracksuit bottoms and stuff like that on. So it was 71. So compared to last, last year, I was the same weight pretty much, but my um, percentage body fat was lower and my lean muscle mass was higher. And I was just like, that just summed it up. Like, you know, same weight as last year, but my whole body composition had changed. And um, it was just, you know, I've now got five years worth of data because I've been doing these assessments through work for the last five years. And to be able to see how it's changed over time is actually quite powerful. And, you know, to be going into kind of my 40s, you know, just turned 39, going into my 40s next year, to be kind of in the, in the green zone, um, I think is you know, the best gift you can give to your children, right? Um, my, my father passed away when I was only two years old. So I've kind of grown up w- without my, my dad, so to speak. And, you know, I, I want to be there for my children. And, I, and the only way I can do that, you can't obviously, you can't predict what's going to happen in the future. But the best I can do is give myself a fighting chance. And the way to do that is to stay active, stay healthy, and lower your risk of heart disease and lower your risk of diabetes and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the assessment that I do gives you a score as to where you are on the scale of, or the risk of heart disease and, and diabetes. And I'm like in, in the below the 1%, which is fantastic to know that, you know, this is, uh, this is working. And, you know, it's got to that point now where we enjoy it so much and we're seeing the results that, you know, we've, we've just invested in converting uh, 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 our garage into a purpose-built gym at home. Um, and, you know, I never would have imagined we would have done that this time last year. And, you know, we've, less, we've invested a lot of money, to be fair, in getting decent equipment um, because we know that it's something that we're going to continue to go with. Um, but even, like, our nine-year-old and four-year-old, they're in there now as well. And well, we might only do a couple of minutes on the, on the, on the max trainer or, you know, a couple of... Um, one kg weights. One kg weights or, you know, like Shane and the four-year-old, he, he loves just hanging off that pull-up bar, for example. And, you know, we have this, how long can you hold? And he did, he did like 13 seconds the other day. Okay, that's pretty good, you know. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> I know, you know, we were shocked. <laughs> you know, I was like, um, <laughs> last time he does it, like, oh, I want to do more than 13 seconds. So, you know, it's, it's already rubbing off on them. And so that can only be a positive thing, right? I think also for me, for my boys, it's for them to know as a female what the dad can do, mother can do to me. Yeah. Because I don't want them to ever think, you know... Training is for guys only. Yeah, training is for guys only. That they shouldn't... You know, there is still that stigma in some certain types of gyms you go to. Like, even when I go to gym on... Which is that hotel one. You know, there is... Like, I'm the only female in that weights area. And sometimes it is, like... I'm surrounded by these guys who are weight training, or so they think. Um, but I, I'm, I'm doing... I'm, cred- I'm there. I'm credible. It's, what I'm doing is credible. Um, but you've had you've had a lot of strangers like coming up to you in the gym yeah. just saying, "Oh, you know, what are you training for? Like yeah. you work really hard. You train so, really hard." Like so, basically, there's these um, when you go half five, it's a different type of t- different type of gym goer, yeah. and there's uh, there's these uncles that are there like all the time, like the the same uncles all the time, and there's two or three women like uh, older ladies, and you got hats off to them. Oh, they're yeah. there every day at half five, and I would want to be like that. Half five in the morning, they're on that treadmill doing that uphill incline. This walking. one, this one lady, she must be, I would say, mid sixty, pushing seventy. And I remember doing like a a, a a ten minute hit on a on a treadmill, and she was next to me, and she was on like one hour, 45 minutes or something like that on the treadmill. And she was just walking, like literally. And I was like, damn, you know, and she's like, she's there every single day. Like every time I'm in, I went to the gym, yeah. without fail, she was there. Yeah. And, and I'm like, you're fair play. Yeah. And a lot of them would come up to me and be like, you know, the uncles would be like, what are you training? You're really strong. What are you training for? I said, I'm training for my kids, training for myself, you know, to make myself strong. And they're like, oh, you know, good for you. Which is nice to hear. You know, I've had women... Beard and I've had a few people come up to us, even said, are you brother and sister? Um, <laughs> random. Which is really random. Um, <laughs> no, I like that. Do you ever go to the gym with your sister, Akash? 
Mm, very rarely. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know. If, do, I don't know. Is that a team? Do brothers and sisters go to the gym together? I don't know. Very, very rarely. <laughs> but you know, the last time I trained with her was on a holiday in India, and she had like we had like afternoon tea before. Yeah. So we were having like she was having like scones and jam, and I said to her, "You know, we're going to do legs today." Yeah, and she's like, "Yeah, whatever. I'll just come along with you." And then within 15 minutes of the session, she was she had to run to the bathroom, just throwing it all up her. Uh, <laughs> so that was the last time we ever trained together. That was about like 18 months ago now. Um, but yeah, no, I've had women come up to me in the gym, like just it was really funny actually. I wore the R and T vest one day. I think I swear to God, this woman thought I was like a trainer mm-hmm. because she was like, "Oh, can you like show me this move?" And, and we have to do this and I was like I'm really not a trainer yeah. but you know women come up to me and say you know like you know we rate you and actually when I say when I tell them how old I am they're like really we thought you were like a student and yeah or like, you mentioned you've got kids and they're yeah, like they're shocked because they're they don't, shocked, they they're don't like, think they don't think naturally they thought oh I'm a student that I turn up there on my um, training so um, it's nice to get that kind of feedback um, like yeah. to get that kind of Recognition, like recognition in the yeah. gym and stuff. Like so one good. of the things that a lot of uh, women in particular the wonder is you know how do you manage being a mum you know having a family a full-time job as well which involves significant travel um, yeah. which isn't local travel either you're not traveling to china and back <laughs> um, how do you how do you manage those things and how, how what kind of tips would you give to women who are in similar situations they want to make a change for themselves they want to put more focus on themselves but they struggle to manage all the different priorities in their life yeah, it's really hard. I think, I've got to be honest, there has to be an element you has to be a bit selfish. Um, uh, you know, I think you, you've got to make, you've, you've got to kind of look at how your family life is. Um, <clears throat> look at how your family life is and figure out how you're going to slot it in because, you know, you know, kids are great in the sense they're quite resilient. Um, so what I tend to do is, you know, I, I had to sacrifice a certain amount of sleep, for example. So my my optimum time, you know, like as you've mentioned about finding your optimum time, the time that's really going to make you effective. Um, so for me, you know, I, it was 5.30 in the morning. So that meant having to, you know, get to bed by 10, 10 p.m. and be up at 5 a.m. Um, and it meant that every, every evening I would have to get my stuff ready, meal prep was done and being organized. Because if that wasn't in place, and I was rushing around in the morning as well as trying to train, I would not have been able to maintain it. Absolutely not. So I think organising is being the first thing and also, you know, work up, you know, keep to structure and routine because kids thrive on structure and routine. So they know at 8am 8, 8 we're leaving. Um, so I had to make sure I was back home from the gym at 7, you know, had showered up, got my stuff ready, got their stuff ready, girls would help out and, and get them all ready for breakfast. We leave at eight, out the door, get to school, you know, 4 p.m., pick them up, go and do activities, and then come back. And it would be that natural. So just to keep creating that rhythm, I think, was really important and keeping to that rhythm. Um, obviously, there'll be times when we had to be a bit fluid and things cropped up and we had to change things around, but that, that's when being organized really helped. Like having that meal prep ready really helped me to not deviate. Um, I think when you're going to start the process, I think it's really important to get into your head is to get that mindset and that goal firmly embedded. You know, I mentioned like that mental, physical, emotional investment that you have to put into it because once that's in place, you'll do whatever it takes to make sure you get it in. Because I remember saying to you once, you know, I struggled like with VR training as well. It was really hard to get this in first thing in the morning. And you said it to me, like, it's just about getting it done. So it's just trying to figure out you know, map out. So whenever, when you added on sessions, I'll sit down there and go, look, you know, I've got to do, this is all the things I need to achieve in a week. How are we going to do this? Um, and you, you have to make sacrifices sometimes. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was reversing out of my diet and kind of moving into a muscle building phase. Sipple was just about to go into her photo shoot. And so I compromised for a couple of weeks mm. on my training and I didn't do, I didn't train four times a week. Mm. I only did maybe twice, if maybe, you know, maybe three mm. to allow Sipil to be able to go to the gym every day. So she could get her list in, she could get her hit in, she could get her training sessions in. Um, so I think, you know, I was happy to make that compromise because I knew what that grind, you know, the Vagella grind, I know what it was about. And that's not easy, right? Like hitting 20,000 steps a day 
when you drive to work and sit at a desk was tough. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so you implemented things like, you know, you walk into work, for example. Yeah, right? so it's like looking, when I saw, touched on earlier about schedules, it's look at where you're at. So I'm quite fortunate in the sense, you know, I work sort of five, ten minutes drive from home. Boys school is five, ten minutes drive from home. So it was literally like this triangle. So what I would do, I changed things up. So I used to leave my car at school. We had a car park. So I used to leave my car at school, drop the boys off, and I'd walk to work, which was half an hour there and half an hour back. Um, if I was doing a list, it would probably be 20 minutes and mm. um, speed walking. Um, so I would, I, I made changes like that. So if you're in a position where you're able to do that, so if you're in a position of, I don't know, if you can drop your kids off 15 minutes early to school and, you know, walk to a train station if you're commuting or, you know, find ways of being a bit creative. Um, even when it was raining, sitting down with rain, the welly boots would go on and my boots good, would go yeah. and I would be hood up and bombing it down. Yeah. Um, so I think it's just trying to find those snippets of time. You can do it. It is about making sacrifices at times. So there might be through a typical day uh, towards the end. So you, you mentioned up to about 8am. What happened after that? 8am. So I would drive to school. The kid drop the kids off to school. They'd run in, not even say bye. Um, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> yeah. I'd literally put my headphones on, lock the car up, backpack on with all my stuff in it, my food, everything. And I'd be walking to work. I get to work for about quarter to nine. Um, and then I usually work till three o'clock. Um, and then I'd walk back, um, pick the boys up. Normally, I'm like after school activities, like literally every day, Monday to Monday to Thursday, the kids have got something on after school, so or homework or whatever. So by the time we've done that, but again, it'd be things like so. Nain has kung fu on Mondays, um, and it's a forty-five minute class at five o'clock. So when he's in there, I'm actually walking. So I literally walk. There's like a Sainsbury's and B and M. So I literally walk to Sainsbury's walk around the aisles, maybe pick up bread or whatever, go to B&M, walk around, buy some rubbish for the house, some candles that I don't need, and then walk back to Kung Fu. And that's how I used to get my steps in. Um, it's funny, isn't it? How, so I know funny. there's lots of articles around and lots of people have commented on how you can get your steps in. Um, you know, those 10,000 steps at the beginning were a challenge. Now 10,000 steps a is, is a breeze because... You, you know, you pick up on those little things. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I've just started working in London now, so it's going to actually make it much easier for me. But when I used to drive, I used to be based in Watford, I used to drive to work, we used to have an overflow car park. And even though there were spaces in the main car park, I would park in the furthest space I could find in the overflow car park just so that I'm getting an extra 250, 300 steps. Um, you know, if I was walking across the road to the canteen, then rather than cutting through the car park, I'd walk around the car park, you know, never use the lifts. All my conference calls were done whilst walking as opposed to sitting at my desk. Um, it and it's funny because then people start noticing and, you know, you get teased a little bit kind of in the office because, oh, you're always walking around with your headphones and what have you. But it's like, yeah, I've got to hit 20,000 steps. How else am I going to do it? It's even things like, I've, like don't do, I don't do home shopping anymore. Like when Vera just taking the boys out on Saturday mornings, I actually go to Sainsbury's, I park at the furthest at car park space I could find. Yeah. I walk in and I actually do my shopping. And you, that's so surprising how much how steps, steps you, can get, yeah. you can get just by doing that. And it does mean like sacrificing a bit of time here and there, but actually if you're savvy with your time, like actually when you go to a lot of the clubs that kids do, um, you, you end up just sitting there. So you might as well just get up and walk yeah. um, and I now I find it I find it hard not to walk actually like you've put me on these 10,000 steps every single day I'm hitting 15 no problems yeah. without even trying like yeah. um, I think we've got the added bonus we've got a dog as well so we obviously in the evenings we take him out for a walk and stuff so that's a given but um, yeah. well, so just going back to your typical day though is that my mum we're fortunate that my mum lives with us so you kind of the boys are in bed by eight o'clock uh, we come down, we have our dinner, and then kind of once we've cleared up, um, we take the dog out for a walk. So usually, like, actually, we probably would have been walking right now. Like yeah. we typically go out about half eight, get back about half nine. So we're going to do an hour's walk in the evening. Um, and actually, you know, it's really, it's nice us time as well. Mm -hmm. Like we both go out, take the dog for a walk in the evening and actually gives us, you know, that hour to talk about our days and, you know, what did you do and, you know, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Because otherwise, 
you're so focused on the kids. Yeah. Um, like literally, you know, I get home at around six, half six. Um, and if the kids aren't already in the bath, then, you know, it's getting them into the bath. Mm. Then it's the whole bedtime routine. And I take one and sister takes the other. We, mm. you know, read them a story, put them to bed. We come down, we have our dinner. Um, we take the dog out for a walk. We come back, we prep all of our kind of protein shakes and all that kind of stuff for the next day. And then by 10 o'clock, we're asleep. Mm. And it's the best sleep because that one hour walk in the evening, it's... Um, you know, I can't, I can't explain how refreshing it is. Because I think a lot of people have mentioned about like sleep and quality of sleep and stuff. And definitely since I've started this journey, I sleep really well. Yeah. Um, but we're I fortunate just... that we can do that in the evenings because, you know, when the boys are asleep, mum's at home. So, you know, we're not leaving the kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just in case. Disclaimer. <laughs> in case they don't call social services or something. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, that does help. I think, you know, utilise what's around you. I mean, you know, a lot of us do have extended family, so I think it's really important. But yeah, but, but you know, there are times mom, where mum was on holiday. Yeah, um, we just and then we just we just all, like, alternate it. So one day she'd take the dog out for a walk. Next day I take the dog yeah. out for a walk. But again, it just comes back to finding alternatives. Yeah, but you know what? Like being on, on, honestly, it is doable. I think it's just it's mind over matter. It, it comes it all comes back to the why. Why are you doing it? But you can do it. And like I'm sure there are busier people than me who've got more kids than I have. Um, but you can do it, and you can balance it back. I mean, you mentioned I travel as well. So yeah, I travel to China twice a year. Um, and last year, I think it was three times. Um, and it. That's tough. Um, traveling there are just a lot of. Sh- um, I do more European, European travel. travel. So you're away almost every other week, right? Yeah, I, I travel a lot. Um, it's only for like a day or two as well, which actually I find more even it's, it's more disruptive because yeah. it might be on a you know I might be on a six o'clock flight to Dublin or to Switzerland or something uh, on one of my training days, and it's like oh, there's no way I can get my training in that day, um, and it's not that I can even go the next day because the next day is. Sithel's training day so where possible you know if we can swap it around we would but um traveling and training is is tough but it just comes back to um the planning right Mm -hmm. so because i do short haul european trips mostly it's just hand luggage so you know i take my food with me i um you know I, i remember you sending an article around you know how to how to manage travel and you know I don't eat anything. I don't eat any plain food, for example. I'll take my own food with me. Um, I take my protein shakes with me. But also, I choose hotels that have got decent gyms. Um, so I kind of do my my investigation up front before I book book my hotel. Make sure it's got a decent enough gym. Sometimes you're not fortunate enough to have decent gyms, but there's always something. And you know, I remember going to one gym and the um, you know, I think I was on the 32 dumbbell presses at that point, and the heaviest weight they had was like a 12 kg uh, dumbbell and I'm like what the, hell, what the hell am I going to do here <laughs> and so I just like smashed out like 30 reps or whatever it was you know just like to failure almost um, because I was like I've got to do it I can't just use that as an excuse I've yeah. got to do it um, also walking because typically if I do travel I'm meeting customers who are based there but I go back to my hotel um, and then I just go for a walk right? again there's there's no um, there's no excuse. I remember, um, in fact, it was, it was the day Sintel's dad passed away because I was in Dublin at the time. And the day before that, because obviously I was uh, in my final weeks up to the, the photo shoot, I was on 20,000 steps. <clears throat> I did all my walking during the day. I did all the usual things that I would do in the office on my conference calls and stuff like that. I came back, I went to the gym and I did an hour on the treadmill just to kind of hit my steps did my hour and I still wasn't close. So I, I left the gym. I went, I had some dinner. I went back into the gym and basically I did like another hour and a half on the treadmill because I was like, I have to hit my 20,000 steps. I've got to do it. Um, and it's that accountability, you know, the number of times I've walked around our dining room table because I'm like, I've got 500 steps left uh, before I hit my, my number. I'm not going to bed until I've hit that number, you know, until that Fitbit has started buzzing that you, you know, you hit your target. And so I'll just walk around the kitchen or walk around the, uh, the house until I've hit that extra 500 steps and I've, you know, I can go to bed knowing that I've hit my target. So, um, you know, sometimes certainly when you're in the, uh, the, 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 the grind end of the, uh, the, the diet, 
it's, it's, you're not going to do 20,000 steps naturally in a day. You, you know, to do 20,000 steps, there's going to have to be at least one or two conscious walks. You know, I used to go out at lunchtime and then I used to go out in the evening again and I might go and do an hour in the gym or something as well. Um, but obviously that's a defined and, and kind of shorter period, but something like 10,000 steps now, you know, it, it, it should be easy for people if you start implementing the little tricks. I think, yeah, I think one of the things I learned with long haul travel was um, sort of preparation. So like when I was traveling to China, <laughs> food out in China is interesting. Uh, they don't understand vegetarianism, even though they're some of them are Buddhists and Buddhists are vegetarian, you don't get a lot of options. So protein was a huge issue for me. Um, so I kind of like, I, you know, I don't like eating protein bars normally. I don't really agree with them, but, um, you know, I take the grenade protein bars. And one of the things that kind of I built, resist, built up was intermittent fasting, actually, mm. because that was one of the things that kind of, you know, in order to control, one of the things I could, you know, read the articles that you guys published in R&T was, you know, managing your calories. And that's one thing I actually really learned actually in this whole process is really how to manage my calories and my food. So what I would do is like when I was flying out, I'd actually just have one Offer. one good meal before I took off and make sure it was in the airport, something healthy, whatever. And then I'd literally pretty much fast through the flight. And I was quite lucky most of my flights were through the night. So you'd pretty much sleep anyway. Um, and I would try and avoid the plain food like mad um, and I what I would do is then kind of put my body clock as soon as I got onto the flight I put my body clock where I was traveling to as, as soon as I could so in China it's eight hours ahead so literally if you're getting on the flight and you're pretty much going to sleep um, and I'd fast literally through the flight and just stick to loads of water um, and then when we landed I would just to get me through because we had a car journey I'd actually have the protein bar as a bit of a kind of a snack and um, what I was conscious of when I landed, I'd be like starving. So I'd be like trying to eat rubbish. So I kind of stuck to that and just kept sticking to water. And then one of the things that really stuck with me as soon as we landed, we train. shower up, we train. Yeah. I'd literally go in the gym, whether it be a hit, a list, or just a quick session. And even if it was for half an hour, literally get in the gym and train and get that going. And then I, I don't ever think I ever suffered from jet lag like severely. Um, and then actually while we were traveling around, I would literally have a really good breakfast and fast through the day. Um, and it was quite easy to do that because you wouldn't want to eat what I had to face. So uh, yeah, chicken feet is not really uh, <laughs> a thing. So um yeah, I would literally fast during the day and then have a have a decent meal at the end of the day, and then yeah, and just carry on through. Training and when you get off the plane is one of the best things you can do for jet lag, and that's something I I learned off. Um, I think I posted in the article, but I got it from a what you know on the the wrestler Triple H. Yeah. Um, so you know the WWE they they're rare traveling all the time for different shows, yeah. right? So to combat jet lag, the first, first thing he the best thing he said is as soon as he hits the hotel, they'll all train. Yeah. So yeah, they're yeah. always fresh. I'd do a recce. Um, I think one trip I remember doing recce with Jim as soon as I got there. I remember emailing her. I was like, oh my god, there isn't, they don't have this, they don't have this. What else can I do? I remember emailing you saying, what alternatives can I do? Because I was like, I can't, like, literally, there's nothing here. So, um, it's really, but and then it, I would set the routine. So, I'd literally, like, no matter what time I went to sleep, I'd get up at like half five, six in the gym again. And honestly, it set me up for the day. It was much easier to manage, cope with what I had to deal with and you know we would be doing like 12, 13, 14, 15 hour days um, out there um, and that was one of the things that really got me through it so bit, and luckily I was traveling with someone who was quite keen to get in the gym as well so we both we'd both be in the gym like doing cardio or my weight training whatever um, but that was my biggest learning curve actually was while I was traveling is managing calories and it and it's interesting that even now I'm with, like naturally I'm really conscious of things that I'm ordering and if I know I'm going out for a meal like how to manage my day in terms of food um like what to cut out when to cut out um certain things not to have the fats um so that was really good like and you guys like you were amazing like whenever I was traveling I'm like right prep me what do I need to do um and what you know I, like by sticking to those kind of principles like I continue to see changes and like you said I was continuing to get leaner while I was out there um 
but yeah, I think um, it, it was literally like take some snacks and get those protein bars if you can't do protein shakes um, and stick with it. Um, and intermittent fasting, actually, I, I actually quite enjoy now. Um, and it's really, it's really quite easy to do once you get past, you know, if you do it at times when you're sleeping most of the time, it's actually doable. Um, Amazing. Let's, uh, let's finish up on a rapid fire. So we'll go um, mm-hmm. three questions and you can go uh, one at a time. Um, so we'll start with, uh, we'll actually answer each one um, accordingly. So the first question, you're just going through a hard dieting phase and you finished it and you're going out for a meal. What's your go-to cheat meal? I went to GBK and had a burger and chips. Burger and chips. Nice. Oh, mine was Disham, like Indian food. That'd be your ideal meal. Yeah, yeah. No, that's what she did. That's what I did. Oh, that's what you did as well. Okay, <laughs> great. Yeah. Uh, number two, um, where are you next going? Where are you next going on holiday, or where do you want to go on holiday? Oh, well, so we both turn forty next year, and we've never uh, since the kids were born. We've never been on holiday, just the two of us. It's always been with the kids. Yeah. So the plan is for our fortieth birthday, because it's only eleven days apart, is we're going to get my mum and Tito's mum to maybe like take turns looking after the kids <laughs> and uh, the plan is to maybe go to Santorini or something like that just to do yeah. us for, for a week if we can. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Uh, who should we have on the podcast next? Ooh, that's a good one. It would actually be nice to actually have more females. Yeah. Yeah. Like some of the, you know, it'd be good to get some more females actually on the podcast. Like, I, I think also like, um, it's, you know, just, just real people, right? Yeah. Like, you know, I'm hoping that the podcast that we're doing with you today will just relate to a lot of people because, you know, we're just we're just a normal couple with two kids and, you know, full-time jobs. And that's a profile that fits so many people. Yeah. Um, yet, you know, we've managed to get great results. I'm just hoping that, like, you know, that, that inspires people. So I think just some more, I mean, it's great to have all of the... Um, the you know the, the experts and the specialists and the subject matter experts because that's another angle to it and I think mixing that up with just yeah. real people that have got real results I think that's the direction of the podcast that that's the direction I wanted to take this podcast is bringing on more clients because as much as I can harp on about doing this doing that yeah. or even experts can go on about what's optimal in the real world it's a different story right and exactly. hearing it from people who are not in the fitness industry is so much more powerful. Yeah, that yeah. can inspire real change in other people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And not just on the physical level, it's just the mental level as well, isn't it? It's like you, you learn so much about yourself through this process. You evolve as a person too. So it would be good to hear from, I think for me, like coming into the RT world, like there are so many, um, there are so many females on the group who are so amazing and have achieved such amazing things. It would be good to hear from them too about their journey because every each of our journeys are so individual um in that sense that we've all like my journey was quite a long journey you know spanned over a year almost whereas some have done it in three months and it's good to get that spectrum of Mm. how they've done it too um yeah there's a lot to be learned amazing is there any final words you'd like to say i know i think for me it's just uh it's probably more of a thank you actually um to you really and uh to the rnt team because uh you know, I still remember the day I saw Sham's transformation on Facebook. You know, I sent you a message, not expecting to hear anything back. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I got a message from you. We had a call that day, and kind of that's where it started. And um, you know, I never went into that expecting to get the results that I did. Um, and for me, it's now a way of life, and uh, you know, a, a positive change. So, uh, so yeah, really, it's just a thank you for for sticking with us through the journey just as much as, you know, we've kind of been accountable to you. Um, so yeah, for me, it's just that really. Yeah. I think, yeah, going off the back of it. Yeah. It's a massive thank you to you guys, especially you, Akash, you've been brilliant. Like literally like all those emails. I, I remember I was going to one of our chains. I think we, we maxed out a hundred messages <laughs> on one chain, <laughs> literally like the whole history. Um, so yeah, it's been amazing, like kind of working with you and, you know, be exciting to see the next stages and also it's exciting to see where else RNT goes to and be part of that journey, which has been great so far but it's so exciting to see them the next steps and be part of that journey too because i do feel like there is a real family vibe yeah um 
so which is really good to see so um yeah and I just I think if I can if either of us can inspire at least one person through yeah. this and through anything else that we do happy well, days well it's absolute absolute <laughs> pleasure but I also know that both of you already inspired a lot of people because you know you brought you've um you know you referred family and friends to r and but what's yeah. really cool about you mentioned Sham is I was saying to Sean the other day is that what his transformation's done is created like a domino effect because the amount yeah. of people that are inspired that initial like bam like no one no one saw that one coming right and I didn't see it coming either the way the way the way it ended up turning out yeah and how many people it's inspired and then it's inspired them to make changes and who've then further inspired other people yeah. and it's just created like a spider web of people who've who've transformed and become better versions of themselves and achieved goals they never set out to achieve which is which is amazing. And I think, you know, um, what the powerful thing is, you know, I didn't know, I don't know Sham. Um, and so for me, you know, ultimately it, it, that, that before after was a powerful before after for me. And that, that inspired me to contact you. But a lot of cynics would just say, oh, it's photoshopped. I think the thing that people mentioned to me is that, you know, they know me, they know I look like that before. And now they can see me look like the after. And so this is not yeah. a photoshop. This is real, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that is powerful because um, it's seeing a before and after of someone that you don't know, um, you know, like I said, you can always think, ah, yeah, that's just, that's, uh, you know, the trick of the camera or whatever it may be. Um, but, you know, when you actually see people that you know going through that transformation, um, I think that's when it hits home more. Amazing. So if you enjoyed today's episode with Sito and Biraj, uh, please feel free to share with your family and friends. For more information, please visit www.rntfitness.com. You can always follow us, follow us on Instagram at rnt underscore fitness or at Akash Fugela. Thanks for listening. Thank you.